Anyway, the man, the NSPCC of called cool Britain's most dangerous and prolific child molester ever, Jimmy Savile, spent 11 successive New Year's Eves at Chequers, the most powerful residence in the land, as a guest of Conservative Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. And today's police report on the 450 abuse crimes Jimmy Savile committed and the 34 known rapes begs the question, why was none of this published or reported in Britain's so-called free press, nor noticed by the police and prosecuted by them until after he was dead? Then there is the Lord McAlpine case. Evidence of McAlpine's innocence from paedophile involvement has still not been tested in court. Chris Patton's BBC caved in and settled out of court. Uh, the BBC is, of course, heavily implicated in Savile's paedophilia, allowing sexual assaults to play, take place on BBC premises. And I suppose we ought also to point out that both two, uh, Lord McAlpine and Chris Patton, are both uh, Tories. Uh, there is still our own Bristol case as well. BBC presenter and child molester Peter Rowell, who's now in jail, he was one of the, also one of the Prince Charles's ambassadors entrusted with assessing young people as part of the Prince's Trust scheme. So today, maybe some closure for victims and their families if they're still alive, but still no justice. Those that censored the transmission of Liz McKean's December 2011 Jimmy Savile Newsnight expose are still working at the BBC. Only the Director General George Entwistle was given a big payoff to walk. BBC under former Bath Tory MP and Cabinet Minister Chris Patton. Uh, of course, they're both uh, colleagues of each other. So I spoke to Michael Shrimpton about this very issue and first put to him questions about the Jimmy Savile and if he thought that the Tory party had really come clean about what Savile had been up to. I'm Michael Shrimpton. My day job is barrister. I used to be an immigration judge many years ago. My other job is as an intelligence and national security consultant. I've just written my first major book, Spy Hunter. We weren't getting anywhere in the intelligence community. We were being blocked persistently and consistently in London and Washington, and it seemed to be that only by bringing public pressure to bear on politicians could you actually get anywhere. It's extraordinarily frustrating. Intelligence is about speaking truth to power, but if there's nobody in power able to act on the intelligence, then it's a little bit pointless gathering it in the first place. There are people still alive who are involved in the paedophile scandal, and obviously I'm not going to name them on a radio program, but the most prominent paedophile associated with the Savile Ring was a man called Edward Heath, uh, who you may, may recall was Prime Minister, and took us into the EEC. And Heath was recruited as something that Christopher Story published in 2005, something which was confirmed to me by um, General Obus Marcus Wolfe of the DVD and the Stasi, Heath was recruited by the Germans in 1937. I've said this in Spy Hunter. Heath was into little boys, and Savile was supplying them. A number of these boys were taken out of the Haute de Guren home in Jersey. Savile was taking children from a children's home with the support of German assets in Jersey. Remember, the Germans used to run Jersey, and whenever the Germans overtake somewhere... There's always a stay-behind intelligence organisation. German assets didn't pull out of Jersey in 45. Only German troops marched out, they surrendered. The German intelligence operation in Jersey stayed on after 45. Jersey was very important to the Germans because of offshore financing, because we do a lot of our offshore financing through Jersey. The banking in Jersey is quite interesting. And what was happening was that children's homes in the Channel Islands, particularly at De Gren in Jersey, uh, children were being taken from these homes, boys in the case of Edward Heath, as he was gay, um, and a paedophile, were being taken onto his yacht, the Morning Cloud. Um, there were, in fact, several Morning Clouds, but um, there was one in particular which won the Sydney Hobart Yacht Race, which was eventually sunk in the English Channel, from memory. Uh, but it was the boat that was sunk on which most of the abuse took place. Savile was actually going out to, he went down to Jersey, and he was actually taking boys. There was another man involved as well, but Savile himself took boys from the children's home, where he was a guest, or welcome, onto the boat. So he was taking boys out onto Morning Cloud. Now, since Heath was well known, and since the boys were talking young men, uh, it depends how you define child, but as a lawyer one would define, uh, normally we define children as under the age of 14, which is the age of criminal responsibility. They were about that age, sadly, but they were old enough to know who was abusing them. 
it's quite clear that in most cases they weren't willing to be abused. And even if they were, at that age, we don't regard consent as informed consent. Defined in the, America, in the United States, I'm afraid, statutory rape. The boys were murdered and thrown off the boat. Now, a very courageous Jersey police officer who was aware of the paedophile ring, was aware that boys were being supplied to politicians and key figures in Jersey, knowing that children had gone missing from the nursing, there's no dispute about that, uh, the police in Jersey were aware that they had missing kiddies. Their theory, which is quite perfectly reasonable theory, was that they must be buried in the grounds. And I think you, if you look at the files, you see there was a, an attempt to uh, find the, their remains by digging up the grounds. Uh, was it Lenny Harper? It's been some time since I looked at the file on this, but if you tell me it was Lenny Harper, I wouldn't dispute that for a moment. What I do know is this police officer was very competent, very courageous, because he was up, up against a cabinet office-backed paedophile ring, and the investigation he was conducting was at some professional risk, and indeed uh, I suspect his life was also at risk at one point, because he was getting close to some very uncomfortable truths for certain people in the cabinet office, GO2 in London, and certain people in Jersey, in the German network, which is, even today, there's still a German network in the Channel Islands. His theory that the boys had been buried in the grounds of the nursing home was a perfectly reasonable one, a good copper. Good theory, but wrong. The boys were, in fact, being taken to a boat. It happened to be a Batiste boat, or yacht, and they were murdered and thrown overboard. So there's no point, sadly, in looking for their graves. They don't have any grave except the sea. That's why the BBC and the Cabinet Office have been so keen to protect Savile. That's why the Cabinet Office in the 1980s were willing to back Savile to the point of giving him a position of authority at Broadmoor, which is an absolute... You, know, you don't put a paedophile in charge of Broadmoor. It's just like putting a lunatic in charge of the asylum or a drunk in charge of a brewery or David Cameron in charge of a government, no offence intended. The cabinet secretary at the time, who thankfully is no longer with us, Hunt, was also a paedophile, was in on this, met Savile. Uh, he was Catholic, met Savile, as did that very nice man, the late Archbishop of Westminster, Cardinal Basil Hume. Basil was not a paedophile that knew Hunt and had a shrewd idea. He wasn't stupid. He had a shrewd idea of what had been going on, and I've no doubt was told to keep a lid on it. The Hunt was in on it, so the Cabinet Secretary at the time was in on it, was aware of what was going on, was aware he had a Prime Minister who was involved not just in abusing young boys, but was murdering them as well. It's quite possible that there was a crewman on the yacht who did the actual murder. I'm not saying it, but he's necessarily bash the boys on the boko and toss them overboard. He may have had somebody do that for him, but he was certainly guilty of murder under English law as an accessory or uh, on the joint enterprise basis. The Cabinet Secretary of the day knew that we had a Prime Minister who was vulnerable to charges of murder at the Old Bailey, a um, bit of a national security mess, and the Cabinet Secretary, as you can well imagine, was very keen to keep a tight lid on things. Uh, Hunt, of course, was working for the Germans, and was very keen on British membership of the EEC, and it was Hunt and Heath between them who were responsible for Britain going to the EEC, along with another German spy, exposed in Spy Hunter called uh, Tony Barber. Now, you're, you're painting a picture of uh, lots of sort of high-level paedophile characters in the centre of government. What on earth purpose would that serve? Oh, if someone is inclined in that direction and you can supply them with boys, then you've got a hold on them, or girls. There's nothing worse for a politician than being exposed in the murder and sexual abuse of young people. And if you've got a politician who is abusing and killing young girls and boys, but boys or girls, then you've got a hold on them. This has been a standard German intelligence tactic for decades. Well, surely it's not just the Germans. I mean, the British intelligence surely are using these kinds of tactics. Any intelligence service would want to. No, we're the good guys. I mean, MI5 and MI6 don't do murder. Obviously, occasionally it's necessary to take people out, but that's always done by independent contractors. We're the good guys. Um, we... You're English. You would say that, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, I am British. I'm in favour of the British, and I certainly count myself as a patriotic Englishman, and uh, I am a Britisher, yes. But we are the good guys, and one of the reasons why we're the good guys is we don't approve of the killing of children. We'd never get British intelligence setting up a shooting like the Sandy Hook shooting in the United States, which was again was set up by the Germans via Mexico, and a bunch of crazy Mexican drug 
gangsters rolling up to a school, shooting up the kiddies. I mean, it's just absolute nonsense. The British judge would never, never touch an operation like that with a barge pole. I mean, you've said yourself that parts of British intelligence have been infiltrated by other countries. So, I mean, you know, how can you say we would never do such a thing? Ah, oh, well, then it's not we, is it? If a German, in, let's take the assassination of David Kelly, that was done by GO2, which is the German operation in London, and you've got German assets inside Thames Valley Police, uh, for example. Where you've got Brits working for the Germans, then you, in my view, is you blame the Germans. You don't blame the Brits, because the Germans are paying them or, or blackmailing them. Peter Furlier is a, a wonderful means, if you're a hostile intelligence agency, of blackmailing politicians. The reason it's particularly disgusting, quite aside from the element of sexual abuse and coercion and corruption of young people, that's disgusting in and of itself. But what makes it particularly vile, and we saw this in the Madeleine McCann case, and that's why the Madeleine McCann case was so heartbreaking and tragic. If the children are, and I'm afraid with paedophilia, we sometimes have babies being abused, but if you're not talking babies, if you're talking toddlers who are able to recognise the people who are abusing them, since the people, there's absolutely no point doing it unless the politician is high profile, since you're talking about people who are on television, people who are high profile, you have to murder the children in order to protect your asset. So for the Germans, it was essential that the boys that were being taken onto the yacht, that was a death ride. When Jimmy Savile was taking, let's say, a 14-year-old boy down to Morning Cloud, handing him over to Ebert Heath or a member of the crew on the yacht, it was a death ride. That was that boy's last journey on Earth because there was no way in the world, recognising Ebert Heath, that he could be allowed back on shore. And Savile must have known this, and that's partly why Savile was probably deeply into religion. You often find this, in fact, that where people get involved in murder, their consciences start to eat at them, and uh, they suddenly turn to religion late in life, and Savile, Savile, certainly there are signs that he did that. It's quite a nice thing about human beings. We, we generally find murder very difficult. It's a lot more difficult to do than, uh, than the, you might think reading spy novels. He also, I'm sure, at Edward Heath, because you've got to murder the kiddies in order to protect your asset, the supplying of children to paedophile politicians is an extremely messy, murderous, dangerous business. The case of Madeleine McCann, as I reveal in Spy Hunter, it was in my report to the Joint Intelligence Committee, which was put on the website disgracefully by the Daily Mirror a few years ago. In the case of Madeleine McCann, she was going to be abused by a senior member of the European Commission in Brussels, whose name is known to British intelligence, I can't identify him in Spy Hunter, but um, I do know who it is. And there was no way that Madeleine could ever be returned alive to her family because the danger would be that even at her tender age of four, she would recognise him and know who was abusing her. So the, the Germans had to murder her, and indeed they eventually did, sadly, in December 2008. Uh, yes, you paint again this picture of a, a rather horrific situation where our leaders are uh, all compromised by these kinds of criminal acts. I mean, what hope is there for humanity and what hope is there for Britain? Well, the answer is to get politicians in who are not compromised. Now, I don't wish to say anything about David Cameron. I'm certainly not suggesting he's a paedophile. He isn't. Uh, I mean, our political parties, Michael, seem to be getting worse at the top. The leadership quality, I mean, for example, somebody for the Labour Party leadership who would have been a quite a positive leader for the country, Robin Cook, it looks like he may have been murdered. So where we've got good politicians coming up, they seem to sort of disappear for one reason or another, or get discredited, and the only ones that seem to survive to lead the parties, all the three main parties, appear to be people who have one way or another have sold their souls. <laughs> well, I, again, I think listeners will understand why I have to give a cautious answer to this question. Your basic premise is right, that politicians can be compromised, that where they're compromised, then it's deeply contrary to the national interest. And the answer is to replace politicians with leaders who are not compromised. You're absolutely right about Robin. Uh, Robin and I got on quite well. I, 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 certainly when I first got to know Robin Cook, there wasn't a lot of distance between us. He became more pro-European. I became increasingly Eurosceptic, although I was very Eurosceptic to begin with. So Robin and I politically grew some distance apart. But he was very pleasant, and uh, you know, I was a Labour candidate at the same election. He was a Labour candidate, obviously, for a safe seat, and I was for a, a very safe Tory seat. But the last time I met Robin was in Whitehall, 
a few weeks before he was murdered. And I can assure you, he didn't look as though he was a man who was about to snuff it. You didn't think, oh, God, but am I ever going to see Robin again? The poor chap looks a bit ill. Uh, he was hale and hearty when I last saw him. Uh, there's no question he was murdered. He was uh, thrown down the mountain. He didn't fall down it. He was murdered because somebody was concerned that he was going to go public with some very damaging intelligence he had, which might have catapulted Britain out of the European Union. Uh, the, the motives for his murder, uh, I think, are very clear. Apart from anything else, Robin Cook was in the loop on the Diana assassination. I'm sure he wasn't in the, the loop before she was murdered, but he worked out very quickly that she had been murdered. And part of the reason for that is that he'd given a very silly speech in Manila, blaming paparazzi for a death. But if you check the records, I think you'll find that Robin was in Manila um, on the night that Diana was murdered. The speech he gave in the Philippines w was far too well informed to be given by a man who'd just been dragged out of bed in the early hours of the morning and, and told that Diana was dead. Robin's speech was based on a briefing from MI6. But Robin, I think, very quickly worked out that somebody in six was in the loop. He was right about that. A very senior MI6 officer was in Paris on the night that Diana was murdered. What he didn't know was that these officers were working for the Germans. But the Germans had assets in six, um, and they were involved. You're, you're uh, talking about Sherrod Cowper-Coles there. I'm certainly not saying Sherrod Cowper-Coles is a German asset. So I'm not a big fan of Sherrod Cowper-Coles, but I wouldn't suggest that um, he was involved in the murder of Diana for one moment. And if I did, your lawyers wouldn't let you broadcast the interview. But um, there were German assets, GO2 assets, inside MI6. Not all of them would have known they were working for the Germans. Um, some of the GO2 boys thought the GO2 was a British operation. Some of the GO2 boys and I sat down and had a drink and I explained, look, boys, you're working for the Jerry's. Uh, they were pretty appalled. They went away, checked it out, realised I was right. And ever since, we've had a good stream of intelligence out of GO2. It's one of the reasons I know that Thames Valley Police are penetrated by GO2. And Robin was a pretty shrewd chap. He, he had a brain, Robin. He was not like Tony Blair. He had a first-class mind. And Robin worked out that Diana had been murdered. And I suspect it was the Diana murder which was the motive for bumping Robin off. There's no doubt Robin was murdered. I mean, a political opponent, very good on his feet, a quick thinker, had a fine mind, first-class mind, very intelligent, and I liked him. I absolutely deplore his murder. It was absolutely outrageous. You cannot go around murdering former foreign secretaries. I simply don't approve of it. My view is that he was assassinated in order to stop him talking about Diana. The Diana inquest was coming up. There was a real fear that the truth might come out. In the, in the end, the inquest was a farce. No offence intended to Mr Justice Scott Baker, but there was always a concern that there might be a proper coroner. By that, I mean a medically trained coroner, not a judge. Judges don't have medical training and they don't make very good coroners. It's absolutely clear he was assassinated, absolutely clear that that was to silence him, uh, and I think tolerably clear that he by then had come to the conclusion that Anna had been murdered and some people in London were in the loop. That was probably the, uh, the motive for the decision to um, sanction him. Well, quite a lot in there. That was Michael Shrimpton, who's a columnist on the website Veterans Today, as well as a barrister, not a QC, as I mistakenly said uh, last week. Well, time to sign off now, but time for the typical topical Afro-tropical show. Dial 0117 955 3721 to join.